Let's open our Bibles this morning to John chapter 1. Today we're going to finish up the beginning part of John's Gospel where it's John's introduction. Introduction to the deity of Jesus Christ. And then we're going to get into next week the, the events of Jesus' ministry. Next week, starting to choose the disciples and then turning water into wine. And we start looking at his ministry. But today we're going to look at verses 14 through 34 of John chapter 1. The title is The Lamb of God. The Lamb of God because this is where John the Baptist calls Jesus the Lamb of God. Now do you remember John's purpose, John the Apostle's purpose for writing this gospel? Because this is what I want to accomplish in your lives. He gave us two things. At the end of his book, he said that he wants you to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, secondly, you would receive life that is in his name. So to believe and then to receive. So the kind of believe that John is talking about is the kind of faith that causes you to come into an experience with Jesus Christ, to receive of him, not just to know about him or to say, yes, I believe what the Bible says. It is in coming in contact and then you personally experience the life that is in his name. Does this sound okay, my voice? Okay, great. I just needed that affirmation. <clears throat> Now, John has told us that Jesus is the Word who was with God and the Word who was God. He's told us that Jesus is the light that shines in the darkness, that he came into the world that is dark, but the world, uh, the darkness of the world did not comprehend or overpower him. In verse 14 of John 1, John writes that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word, a title for Jesus, He became flesh, meaning He took on a human form like us. He dwelt among us. That dwelt is tabernacle. It's like a tent. It means He took on His body and He camped out here. And he did it so that we could behold him. We could look at him. We could gaze at him. God becomes man, becomes like us, so we can examine him, look at him. And he is full of, full of glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So today we're going to hear from John the Baptist. Picking up at verse 15, we get John the Baptist's testimony. And the three questions we're going to ask today is, number one, what is John the Baptist's testimony? Because we have John the Apostle's testimony, and now we have John the Baptist's testimony, and remember, that God establishes truth by two or three witnesses. So he's giving us reliable witnesses of the identity and nature of Jesus Christ. What is John the Baptist's testimony? Second, who was John the Baptist? He's a Bible character, we know. But really, who was he? And third, why is Jesus called the Lamb of God. He calls Jesus by many names, but we're going to finish up with this, this declaration that Jesus is the Lamb of God. Why is he called that? So the first question, what is John's John the Baptist's testimony? At verse 15, John writes that John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, this was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was 
before me. <clears throat> and of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Now John has been baptizing. People are coming out. The crowds of people are coming out. They recognize that John, who we call John the Baptist, is a man of God. They acknowledge that he is not like the other religious leaders. He's not just following the system. He can be trusted, and they listen to him. And so many people are repenting of their sins and being baptized that the Pharisees have come out and saying, who are you? Who are you? And John the Baptist said, he has to clarify, that he is not the Messiah. Again, remember that when Jesus comes, the world is looking for answers, and so God gives them his word. The word becomes flesh. John the Baptist said this about the coming Messiah, that number one, he is preferred before me. Now that's kind of a, a passing phrase to you and I, but this was significant in the Jewish culture because John is saying that, that this man, Jesus, who is younger than him, is actually to be given greater honor. Now to the Jews, the older would always receive greater honor. But John is saying that this Jesus is preferred before me. He is greater than me. Secondly, he says that we have all received of his fullness grace upon grace. Now that grace upon grace just means grace comes and then waves of grace just keep coming and coming from God. But how are they coming? Through Jesus Christ. So God the Father is supplying Remember the word grace is also the word supply. So John the Baptist is saying, we all receive the abounding waves of God's grace through Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust, and that even the rains that come from heaven, now it hasn't rained much this summer, but all of a sudden, I woke up in the middle of the night and it's just pouring, pouring rain. Did any of you work to get it to rain? No, the rains just come. And you know what the Bible says? That God does that. Now, isn't it just nature and the systems of, of the earth that cause it to rain? Yes, but who designed the systems of of, of the rain clouds and falling over and the water dropping from the clouds. God did all of that. So God calls, causes it to rain on the just and the unjust. Rain is God's supply. And even as the rain causes the earth to bring forth and bud and spring, the, the seeds, the dead seeds are going to bring forth life. That is a picture of the grace of God abounding toward us and bringing forth life. So we have all received grace upon grace, God's supply through his Son. He says that only Jesus has the nature of the Father. He is the only begotten Son in the bosom of the Father. Only begotten, what does that mean? He is the only man with the nature, the same nature as the Father. Remember, you and I are sons of God by adoption. He has declared the Father, also John says. He has declared, declared, revealed, made known. So John the Baptist tells us that 
This Messiah is preferred before him. We have all received grace from him. He is the only begotten Son of the Father. Fourth, he has revealed, declared the Father. And fifth, finally, his name is Jesus. This wasn't known. John tells us his name is Jesus. We just say Jesus, Jesus, but at some point it had to be revealed that this man who looked like the rest of us, John says it's Jesus. Jesus is even telling us his purpose for coming. Jesus, Jehovah Hashua, God has become our salvation. God has become our salvation. Now John again says, the only man who has divine nature is who? Who? Jesus. So other people might say that we have divine nature. What celebrity is just well known for saying that all of us possess divine nature? Shirley MacLaine. Now that's, that's going back a way. Some of you younger people going, who? Shirley McCoo? Now Shirley MacLaine is an older celebrity in Hollywood. She is, she is one of the ones in Hollywood leading the way that we're all divine. And you just need to discover your divine nature within you. Now, something funny happened. She would hold these big it would be like a crusade or a rally to us. She held a big meeting in Long Beach, California. She filled up the arena. <coughs> People came to hear from Shirley MacLaine that you are God. Toward the end of the, the meeting, she gave everybody a candle and said, now I want you to light your candle. And as they were holding their candles, she says, now even as every candle has its own light, so each of you has your own divine light. You just need to find the divine within you. And then something funny happened that was almost a trick from God. As all the candles were lit, the heat from the candles set off what? The fire sprinklers. And just as Shirley MacLaine is saying, you are God, the sprinklers come on and put out all the candles. Maybe you're not God. If you're God, can your light be put out so easily? I don't think so. So the second question, who was John the Baptist? Who was John the Baptist? Because we're being asked to believe his testimony. Many people have come along and given these testimonies that were false. At verse 19 through 23, now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem <coughs> to ask him, who are you? Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you that prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, John the Baptist is one, the cousin of Jesus, but he is the older cousin of Jesus by, by how much? Six months, six months. So when John the Baptist says about Jesus, he is preferred before me, it's because John the Baptist was older, everyone would think, well, John would be preferred or honored above Jesus. 
And then John the Baptist says, no, he is preferred before me. Why? Because he was before me. A declaration of his eternal nature, the nature of Jesus Christ. John tells us that he is the voice of one crying in the wilderness. The Bible says that a forerunner will come, preparing the way for the Messiah to come. Isaiah 40 says, as John is quoting, that he is the voice of one crying in the wilderness. What's interesting about that passage in Isaiah 40, it's not just that Isaiah predicts a forerunner is coming, and it's not that John the Baptist is saying, well, I am that forerunner. If you go back to the historical context of Isaiah 40, it's important that Isaiah is predicting the time when the Jews will return from Babylonian captivity. That there will be a, a highway returning from captivity back home. It's a picture of their release from slavery after 70 years. And even as God would prepare a way in the wilderness, to come back from slavery, this is like one of those moments where God is saying, this is a moment for you to be released from your bondage. Be released from your bondage. And Isaiah is saying, I am like that, that prophet saying, get out of bondage, get out of your captivity and follow me. So he's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. But even Jesus said that of all of the prophets, John is the greatest. Now, John is the last of the Old Testament prophets. We would say from Samuel to John the Baptist was the line of the Old Testament prophets. Now, there were some great prophets, Ezekiel, Elijah. And yet Jesus said of John the Baptist, he is the greatest of the prophets. Why? Because he knew more than any of those prophets. And remember, all the prophets were preparing the way for Jesus. Peter said that it was the Spirit of Christ that was in the prophets, predicting the coming of the Messiah and the salvation that would come to us, he said in 2 Peter. But this John the Baptist is the greatest the greatest. In verse 28 of John 1, John writes that these things were done in Bethabara, beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. Bethabara <coughs> is the correct place. Some of your translations might have a different name, but it's Bethabara. And it also is a significant context for what John is doing. Because Bethabara is the place where the Jews came into the promised land. This is the place, and historically the Jews might be standing there remembering the importance of what happened in this place. You remember when the, the waters of the Jordan parted, what God told them to do? in the dry ground of the, the River Jordan, the book of Joshua, they were to st set up stones of remembrance. Stones of remembrance so that the children of the generations would remember what God had done in crossing over and giving them a land flowing with milk and honey. This is the place to remember what God had done. But more than a place to remember coming into the promised land, this is the place where God is taking the generation of John the Baptist and Jesus into a place of rest. Not a place, but a person. Jesus Christ himself. There at Bethabara. Now, the third question I had is, is, why is Jesus called the Lamb of God? 
And you're, you're catching on that there's so, there's several references here to the fact that it's time to come out of bondage. It's time to come out of the slavery that was the nation of Israel. They're not captives like they were in Egypt or Assyria, but they're bound in tradition, bound in religion that is not serving them. Why is Jesus called the Lamb of God? At verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that, I should, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water, and John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained on him. Notice that John the Baptist calls the Holy Spirit He. He. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water, that's the Father, said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testify that this is the Son of God. Now, again, John tells us that the Messiah is preferred before him because he was before him. He is the one whom the Spirit descended on and the Father said, John is to go baptize, but so far John, even though they were cousins, he was cousins with Jesus, didn't clearly know that Jesus was the Messiah. Isn't that interesting? That Jesus was so much like us. He was so humble, not promoting himself, that the Father had to say, the one that you see the Holy Spirit descending on and remaining, that's the one. That's the one. And so the Messiah will baptize not with water, but with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And he is the Son of God. Why does he call him the Lamb? He is the Lamb of God. The two main things I want you to write down, which you know, is that Jesus is the sacrifice. Now the Jews are looking for the Messiah, but they're not looking for us a Messiah to be a sacrifice. And so from the very beginning, John the Baptist is telling them what is going to happen to the Messiah. He is the Lamb of God. He is going to be sacrificed. What's cool is just looking at the references of lamb in the Bible. If you go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, do you know the first reference to lamb? It is Genesis 22. Now, I knew you knew that, right? It is Genesis 22. Now, what's the Bible story in Genesis 22? You should know this. This bug is bugging me. It's Abraham and Isaac. Abraham and Isaac. This is the story. We all know this, Sunday school class, that God tells Abraham to take your son, your only son, up onto the mountain and sacrifice him. Now, Abraham is a picture of God the Father. Isaac is a picture of the Son of God. The Father is giving his son. Now, Abraham knows that, the, that God doesn't require human sacrifice. And the New Testament tells us that he is going to obey the Father, knowing that if necessary, he would raise his son from the dead. So Abraham gets all the supplies, the firewood, everything. He and Isaac go up on to, mount, to the mountain, which is Mount Moriah. 
which is, by the way, the very same mount where Jesus is crucified, Golgotha, is Mount Moriah. And on the way up, you know the story, Isaac says to his father, where is the lamb? Where's the sacrifice? There's something fishy about this. And Abraham says to his son, what? God will not just, yes, God will provide, God will provide himself a sacrifice, a lamb. The, the double meaning that is buried in the Hebrew is that God provides, but God is the sacrifice. Number one, God provides, but number two, God is the sacrifice. And the first mention of a lamb in the Bible is a reference to the sacrifice of the Son of God on Mount Moriah. There's a girl that works at the Starbucks by my house. Her name is Moriah. And she has a name tag on. And I said, oh, that's a neat name. I didn't know if she knew it was a Bible name. She says, yeah, it's from the Bible. I said, do you know what it means? She said, no. I said, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. In this mountain, Mount Moriah, it shall be seen. And you go forward, and she thought that was so cool, that God provided on that mountain the death of his son. Now you go forward to, now the first mention of a lamb in the Old Testament is Genesis 22. It's about Jesus. Guess where the first mention of a lamb in the New Testament is? Yes, you already know this. It's John chapter 1. It's John chapter 1 where John the Baptist says, this is the Lamb of God. First mention in the Old Testament, Abraham and Isaac, Genesis 22. First mention in the New Testament, John chapter 1. John the Baptist says, this is the Lamb of God. Revelation says that he is slain from the foundation of the world. God will provide himself a lamb for an offering. Why else is Jesus called the Lamb of God? Well, secondly, it's because Jesus is showing us what the Father is like. He is revealing the Father. Now, religions throughout time and history have wanted to know what God is like. Maybe God is like the thunder. God is like the earthquake. Or there's a God for this and a God for this. What is God like? Is God angry? <clears throat> and Jesus will say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. John the Baptist says, that Jesus has declared the Father. No man has seen God at any time. But we've seen Jesus, and isn't he God? So Jesus will say later in the book of John that no man has seen the Father at any time, which means that whenever man saw God in the Old Testament, who did they see? Who did they see? Jesus. Roger and Don's kids know all the answers. <laughs> no man has seen God at any time. These are these, these contradictions that the critics and the cults like to pick up on. No man has seen God at any time, so Jesus can't be God if we've seen him. That's one of the arguments of the Jehovah's Witnesses and other cults. Let's clarify, no man has seen the Father at any time. No question. But the only begotten Son in the bosom of the Father, He has revealed Him. So, what is God like? What is God the Father like? Look at Jesus. And you might even get more specific and say, 
Now, what does God think of marriage? Listen to what Jesus says about marriage. What does God think about sin? What did Jesus say about sin? What does God think about religion and the hypocrisy of religion? You just go down your list. What does God think about suffering, about the poor, about death? Jesus has revealed the heart of the Father. He is the Word. He is the Word. What does God think? Listen to Jesus. If you've seen me, you have seen the Father, Jesus says. He is a lamb. He is humble. He is compassionate. He is gracious. He's not snarling and angry. He is revealing the Father. In every way, John the Apostle wants you and I to know that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Son of God. The last things I want you to write down are four lessons from John's Gospel. Number one, what I just said, is that Jesus is God. Jesus is God. I think we hear that so much, I'm not even sure what, you know, what does that mean to you? Yes, I know Jesus is God. What it should mean is that he is greater than any problem that you're facing. You have a problem and you call me and say, I have this need, but I'm not big enough to help you with all of your needs. I'm not big enough to get you out of your trouble or to deliver you from your sin. I am not the person to fix everything you're facing. Even the people who were close to Jesus will discover how great he is. When Mary and Martha's brother dies, Lazarus, they thought, well, Jesus is big enough to heal him, but that's about it. When Jesus finally comes to the scene and sees that Lazarus has been dead and buried several days, what does Jesus think about death? Well, he's, he gives life to the dead. He is the resurrection and the life. He is God. And they discovered that in the middle of their needs. You'll discover who Jesus is in the middle of your needs. Secondly, that he reveals the Father. He reveals the Father. Now, again, that's a pretty simple statement for me to make. But I wonder how many times you and I get into trouble and we automatically think that God is disappointed with us, he's angry with us. You don't know what God thinks of you. Does he still love me, even though I've disappointed him over and over? Has he given up on me? So I need to know what the Father thinks of me by looking at Jesus. Did Jesus ever give up on people because they were weak? Did he pass by anyone who called out to him? Did he go out of his way to minister to the poor? Absolutely. So I can look at Jesus and say, this is what the Father thinks of me. He reveals the Father. Third, that grace and truth are found in Jesus. Grace and truth. Grace is God's supply. So how does God supply to me? Through Jesus. Waves upon waves of the supply in my need. And truth, Jesus will tell us in John 8. Truth, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So I want both of these. I want the supply of God's grace, 
and I want to know the truth. Where are they? In Jesus. And fourth, ultimately that life is in Jesus Christ. Life is in Jesus Christ. Now, <coughs> John is talking about spiritual life, not just physical life or coming into this world, but the very purpose of life, the principle of life, is found in Jesus Christ. Even, you know, I just, I see how busy my week gets and my life gets. Drew, you can go ahead and come up. And I think my, my week is so busy serving people and doing the ministry and how easy it is to neglect my fellowship with the Lord. How easy it is to not pray. And I think, Lord, I've done all this work for you, but I forgot to talk to you about it. Now, what happens to you when you go through the week without much time with the Lord? You're not in prayer. Don't you notice how dull your awareness is of spiritual things? Do you notice how, how just kind of bland your appetite is for the Bible? Oh, let's go to church. Let's worship. Let's have a Bible study. But pay attention to how how just kind of flat your senses are spiritually. Where's the vitality? Where's the appetite, the hungering and thirsting for righteousness, as Matthew recorded in the Sermon on the Mount? What's missing is life. What's, what's missing is spiritual life, which looks like an excitement for spiritual things, a love for God, a passion for God, excitement to see His people and to hear from His Word. Life is found in Jesus. Now, and even if you're born again, you say, well, I, I'm born again, I have life. But even the daily vitality of life, the daily experience of life. Jesus said he came that you might have life and that more, what? Abundantly. So if you don't experience that, that experience of abundant life, do you know you can get it simply by spending time with Jesus? There it is. I've lost it. I don't know what to do. Well, Make time to hang out with Jesus. And you'll notice that it just starts to come back. Your excitement for spiritual things comes back. And you know, it's so dangerous to let it go. It's dangerous to neglect your spiritual life and lose the appetite. It means something's wrong. If you don't love the Word, if you don't Look forward to just talking with the Lord. Lord, today we just ask you would renew us, refresh us in these basic things, Lord. I know that we get, we get distracted, Lord, and Lord, would you just fill us with your spirit? Would you overflow our lives with the power of your Holy Spirit? And Lord, and even in this coming week, we look forward to moments of fellowship with you. That we take the time to seek after you, Lord. If we, we see that we're discouraged or needing wisdom, Lord, we remember it's in you. It's found in you. You've declared, you've revealed the Father to us. Grace and truth are in you, Lord. And so, Lord, may you just be the focus of our attention, that we love you, live for you, Lord. And of course, we, Lord, we look for your return. Keep us this week, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless.